na 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 Hallelujah Hallelujah Praise the Lord everybody Praise the Lord everybody Friday night Hallelujah Friday night, praise the Lord, another opportunity to fellowship. We thank God for this Friday night. We never take it for granted. Hallelujah, how blessed we are to have an opportunity to fellowship and open up the word and allow God to do what he's doing right now for those who are hungering and thirsting and continuing to join the fellowship. There are many other things people could be doing on this Friday night, many, many things, and many are doing those things, but that's not our issue. We're going to continue to try and um, go deeper in the word and avail ourselves even more. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody checking in. Soldiers showing up on Friday night. That's right. All the soldiers of the Lord are showing up, turning themselves over, turning themselves in, getting closer to their God growing in grace, knowledge, and understanding. It's not a game we're playing. We're not playing a game. We're getting serious about the callings on our lives. We're getting serious about the great salvation that God has set before us. We're getting serious and finally getting to the point where we really want to desire to turn ourselves over just a little bit more and experience less of the same old, same old year after year and more of the exceedingly great and precious promises that God has promised for those that are his. You understand? If you're anything like me, and I don't know that you are, I mean, we're all flesh and blood and we're all his creation, but all of us are not his children right now. Many of us are desiring to become his children because those who are children of, the dis of disobedience, you remain the father, uh, the children of the enemy. And again, we're going to speak truth on this thing. We're not playing like we're one big happy family and everything is okay because it's not okay. There are many people who call themselves children of, of, of God and, and Christians and you're living contrary. And I don't want to hear uh, nobody's perfect and he's working on me. That's fine. Let him continue to work on you. But as he's working on you, work with him. The Bible says the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord, which means you must walk in those steps. If you're walking contrary to those steps, and you know you should be doing something different and you're not doing it, then that's disobedience. And that's just downright foolishness. And nobody is going to continue to hold your hand because at some point, God will allow you to be turned over to a reprobate mind, a reprobated mind. And you will reap what you sow and you will be out there experiencing things that you have no desire to experience as a son or daughter of the Most High God. We were created to be blessed beyond measure. We were created to do things that we have yet to walk into the fullness of or even get the understanding of. And that's why we're coming here now. We're opening ourselves up to get a deeper understanding. As God gives me a deeper understanding, I come forth before you to share what God is doing in my own life. Have I arrived? Absolutely not. I'm nowhere near where God is going to take me. But I will tell you this, I am on the path and I am fighting every day to hold on to that which he's given me. And I continue to go deeper on this trail knowing that there are few on this path and knowing that God will not allow anything to come into my life to contaminate the investment that he has in me. He has not made me common. He has not made me normal. He's not made me better than anybody else, but I do understand who I am in him and I understand who he is. And for that, I'm willing to separate and sacrifice from anything or anyone to get that for which I have been apprehended. And that's where we want to understand on these broadcasts is how desperate we have to be for that which God has set aside for us, how hungry we have to be for that which God has for us, and, and how we have to be willing to let go of anything that's stopping us from getting where he desires to take us. Because nothing he wants to remove from our past or our present equals that which he has in our future for us. It's not even close. He said, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, which means he's never even showed another man what it is he has for you, for those that love him. But he says that the spirit has searched these things out, which is why we have to develop our spirit man. So tonight we're going to get into that. Uh, like always, we're going to go into prayer first and give God thanks. 
And then uh, I want you to have your Bibles. I want you to have your pens, have your paper, whatever it is you have. Because like always, God does not waste time. There's a word from somebody who wants a word. There's an opportunity to grow for anybody who wants to grow. There's an opportunity to come closer to anybody who wants to come closer in the name of Jesus. You know, he said, whosoever will, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. It's your choice. It's not pastor's choice. It's not wifey's choice. It's not mama's choice. It's not junior's choice. It's your choice. God holds you accountable for your choices, the choices you make that bring you closer and the choices that you make that cause you to go astray. Because God does not tempt you to go astray. No, he does not. He loves you. He wants you to enter into this place of power, authority, peace, prosperity, and more importantly, purpose. Because the world needs people of purpose more than it needs anything else. Not people who just settle for jobs and careers and doing things that they're good at, which the enemy is good at too. God is looking for people who are people of purpose, divine purpose purpose, who dare to be different, who dare to be singled out, who dares to go through something that the majority of the people are not willing to go through, who dare to be persecuted, to be ridiculed, to be rejected, uh, to be afflicted. This is all part of the process of getting your divine inheritance because Jesus had to go through it. And as a son of daughter, you cannot run from it. You can shy away from it, but ultimately you're going to have to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and go through this wilderness that we must go through to be supernaturally endowed with power and allow your natural man to be dealt with so that your spiritual man can be raised up and that the environments around you can be brought into subjection like they were supposed to be when Jesus was on the scene and when God originally created the earth and spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light. And so it was. Everything under the word has to come under subjection to the word through an anointed, surrendered, sanctified, set apart vessel of the Lord. Don't miss that. Surrender, sanctified, set apart, Holy Ghost filled, hungering after thirsting and uh, hungering after righteousness. Vessel, God says, it's nothing for you. He said, one can put a thousand to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. So all we need is the few. Remember, God's not after the multitude. He was never after the multitude. He was after the few because the multitude won't pay the price to get this. So let's go into prayer and then we're going to get right into the word. Do you have your Bible? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, O Heavenly Father, for another opportunity to come before you, just fellowshipping over your word, knowing that we are a blessed people, O Heavenly Father, that you've conquered all things on our behalf, that you loved us enough while we were yet in our sin to send your son Jesus Christ down, O Heavenly Father the precious lamb, O Heavenly Father, who, who, who sacrificed his life and shed his blood on Calvary's cross, that we may be redeemed, purchased back out of the hand of the enemy, to be perfectly reconciled into fellowship and purpose as you created us in the very, very beginning in your image, in your own image. We ask on tonight that you continue to soften hard hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh, that you continue to renew minds that are captivated with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, that you continue to wipe out the purpose that a man and the world have, have put in your children, and you begin to reveal the divine purpose that you have for their lives, no matter their ages, no matter their states or where they are, that you begin to pull them out and give them the courage to take the steps necessary to bring about lives of change, that through their lives, that uh, the, all those that are connected to them, their lives will change, and we will begin to uh, get in the movement that was started many years ago by Jesus Christ and his original disciples that we will pick up where they left off and deny ourselves and that which is legitimate for us. But we choose to take your plan for our lives, not our own plan, not the plan that the world says, definitely not the devil's plan, but your plan. As difficult as it may be, as hard to understand as it can be, we surrender ourselves on this night that you take us a little bit closer and move more of us out of the way, and you move in. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless everybody on the night once again. Um, we're going to start out in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. 
you have your Bible, we're going to start out in Ephesians chapter 6. I know it's Friday night, and I know people have had a long week, and there are many things we like to do after we've had a long week of working. And one of those things is uh, to relax. People, you know, they want to relax because the wear and tear of the world, the, the 9 and 5, the 40-hour work week, the hustle and bustle, it wears people down. It steals their joy. It steals their peace. It steals their health. It takes away meaningful experiences, precious time in fellowshipping with God to really find your purpose and to access the keys to get your inheritance, to be able to set you free from that system, to come into the system of uh, of liberty, of life, uh, of real meaning, of knowing you're going to live a long life with true salvation and deliverance from anything that attacks you, from entering into a life where you don't have to fear the future of entering into a life where you trust the king and it doesn't matter who the president or the vice president or the congress is at any time because you understand that all things are under his control. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to renew our minds and renew, allow the word to renew us to a point where all of our old ways of thinking are cast out and we allow the new way, the new creature, the new creation to rise up and begin to order our steps, bring our bodies under subjection and allow God to really put his hand on us and take us someplace where very few have dared to go. I mean, really, it is such a great salvation, and we want to get that, but we never want to miss the point before we get into our lesson of why Jesus said that many are called and few are chosen. You know, it's very important that we understand this because we're fighting for something here. We know we're fighting. There's a war in our bodies every day and there's spirit and flesh. The flesh will never just lay down and die on its own. He has to be, he has to be crucified. He has to willingly be brought to death by your hand. God's not going to do it for you. He sent Jesus to give you the opportunity and the means to do it through the Holy Spirit being sent back as a comforter. So we have the tools to do it, but it has to be brought under subjection and killed by your hand. And it will be by his hand that you are resurrected as a vessel of power, authority, prosperity, and everything else that he's promised you for uh, willing to follow him into the unknown and into the place that he created you for. So he says, many are called, but few are chosen because everybody calls to go on this path, this narrow path of denying yourself, of turning over your heart, of turning over your will, of turning over your talents, of turning over your ambitions. It's something that you just don't hear. It's not even preached in many churches right now. You know, uh, many people will teach you that, you know, once you come to the Lord, you can... Uh, you can still do what you used to do and how you want to do it. You know, you run right back in the world. I did a basketball clinic yesterday for some young men and I was talking to a young man and seven or eight of them had just gotten baptized maybe about two months ago, three months ago, and he had a shirt on and I read his shirt and I asked him, now what? He goes, well, I've been baptized. I'm just going to uh, be open and see what happens. And I looked at him and said, wow, well, that's amazing. Well, can I share something with you? Is that, you see, once you get baptized and you go down, that means the old creature is dead. He's done with. When I come up, I'm a new creation. I'm a new man. And I have turned myself over to a new master. I have taken the papers out of the hand of Satan. And I've given them to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to order my steps, to guide my life, to rest, rule, and reign over me that I'm no longer my own, that I must sit still now and get to know him because his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. I, I was a natural man. Now I'm trying to become a spiritual being. And that takes all of me, not part of me. But see, part of the deal is even right now today, many of you were baptized just like I was. And many are going to be baptized in the future. And they have no understanding that once you get baptized and you come up out of the water, life as you knew it is over. It's over. There's a whole new life now. Your life now must be as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your life must be spent spending more time studying his word, sitting at his feet, allowing him to renew your mind, bring your body under subjection, and teach you how to be a spiritual being because you have no training in being a spiritual being. You've been natural way longer than you've been spiritual. It is so comfortable to do things the way we've always done them because that's just that's the only thing we've known. So what we need to do right now is radically bring damage unto ourselves, radically allow God to have his way, even though we don't understand it and won't always feel good. He says that it'll be for your good in the long run. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm merely sitting things aside and training you 
and blessing you in a manner that you don't understand simply because you are a babe in spiritual training and spiritual warfare. You see what God needs right now, and we're going to get into this in this lesson. If you have your Bible, remember, we're going to start out in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 10 when we get going. Ephesians chapter 6, and you got to have your Bible. Don't ever come without your Bible. I don't want you just listening and then the word goes through your ear, out your brain, and you don't take any notes and you can't reflect on it later on. So when we pick back on the lesson tomorrow or another day, that you are not right where you need to be following along. You see, we got to grow in this thing. So on last night, we talked about, uh, we talked about, we were in the book of Matthew in the 13th chapter, and we talked about the treasure that's hidden in the field and the man. How when he had found it, he hid it. That was the first thing he did was he hid it. And then for the joy thereof, he went and sold everything that he had and he bought that field. You know, this is about you and I buying the field. But first of all, it's about us seeking in the field. The field is the word of God. The field is the mysteries of God. The field is many of us are still operating, doing things that we're good at but it's not the thing we were created for. And we're happy just being of use, of being productive. I heard a lady in a meeting yesterday say something that blew my mind and I was in a room full of saints and one of them said, and I want to identify her, you know, talked about people serving. People just love being busy, you know, love doing something. And it looks like they're doing something. But here's the deal. If we're not doing it the way God said we could do it and we're not reaping all the benefits the way he said we could reap, that we are the answers to bring the world in order, that we could stop a lot of this crime, that we could subdue the enemy, that we could cast him out, that we could bind him up and cast him out and we're not doing that, then I don't see how you can be happy with the life that you're living, knowing you're living way beneath the power and authority that you have, that people are dying that don't need to die. Young people are going through things they don't need to go through all because we are selfish with our lives and we like our lives, but yet we look at the lives of everybody around us and we go, oh, well, they have their chance. They don't work hard. No, the Bible says in Romans 15 and 1, it says, we then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. I am my brother's keeper. When I was a child, I thought as a child, it was all about me. But when I became a man and Jesus Christ got a hold of me and he began to teach me who I was and who I could become and the great and marvelous gifts that he set before me, if I would just open myself up to walk after him and deny myself from the gifts of the world, that he would exalt me in due time and he would make me an answer to many people, that many people would be delivered who otherwise would stay captive and they wouldn't just be delivered from the wiles of this world, but they would also have an opportunity to have eternal life with him and be saved and live forever. And also they in turn could be taught to do the exact same thing of generations of their family. This is not a game. This is not a game. We are the hands and the ears and the eyes and the vessels through which all of heaven wants to flow through and invade the environs of the earth and take control of this out of control world. Once again, God is looking for people who he can trust to say, let there be light and there will be light to speak something that's crooked and it will become straight to speak into something that's cursed, diseased, and it shall be healed. That's what God is looking for. He's not looking for more church members. He's not looking for more religious people. He's not looking for people who just want their cable bill paid or a new car or to be delivered from the little burdens that you have, your little bills paid, so you can just sit around and think you're going to be happy, not knowing that as soon as you think you get happy, the devil come right back and throw something right back up on you because you know what? He knows that you're carnal. He knows that you're a babe, that you don't really know who you are. So he's never going to give you rest until you get him up off you and you make him afraid of you. You want Satan every time you walk on the block. You don't want him to change sides of the street. You want him to change streets. You understand? Don't just change sides of the street. Go to a whole nother block when you see me coming. And when I come that way, it's just a matter of time before I meet up with you. Well, I'm going to kick you out of the city because you have no business here because God has empowered you now to do and become something that you didn't know that you could become. So let us look at Ephesians chapter 6 right now, verse 10. This is the most important thing now. Look what the Apostle Paul says. He's writing to the Ephesians at the church of Ephesus. He's telling them about this great salvation that they have accrued 
from this one Jesus Christ and what this salvation means. This salvation is bigger than uh, the fact that they have their carnal needs met, that they have their fleshly desires satisfied. He's saying it's so much deeper than that because you are the soldiers that have in, that they have been chosen before the foundations of the earth to enlist into the army of the Most High God to be his vessels upon the earth to bring it in subjection and to deal with his enemy. But look what he tells them and he warns them. In verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm telling you, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But how can you be strong in the Lord and you have no desire to learn his word? You have no desire to spend time with him. You have no desire to let go of your will for his will. You have no desire to increase your spiritual man and allow your natural man to just fade away and die and become the vessel that God has ordained you to be so that God's will can be done as we prepare for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you not understand that just like John the Baptist was a forerunner, he was picked out and chosen by God to go into the wilderness until the time that the word of the Lord came unto him and sent him out to begin to preach repentance, huh? for the remission of your sins to all of the people in Jerusalem, Judea, and all the surrounding villages and countries at that time. John the Baptist was a forerunner. You and I are created and saved to be forerunners, to preach the same message, repentance of sins, salvation and victory in one Christ Jesus in spite of what's going on in the world, in the economy, in the times, it does not matter. Jesus Christ remains the way, the truth, and the light. But you'll never know it until you get strong in the Lord. Can you make someone else strong in the Lord? If you're lackluster in the Lord, when you come to me with your testimony and you begin to share, it's like Mary and Elizabeth. When Mary had been supernaturally impregnated by the Holy Ghost and the angel told her that her cousin Elizabeth had also had been visited by an angel and she too was with child. Then Mary went up to see Elizabeth. And as Mary began to speak to Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth's stomach began to kick. It began to leap. You understand? Because Mary had the Holy Ghost. She was pregnant with a holy child. So what I'm saying to that is, if you indeed are a son or daughter of God and you and I meet, when we begin to speak, something in me should kick. Something in me should leap because you have something divine in you. But if you're just a normal little baby Christian who desires to just run around the playground and swing on the swings and get on the sliding board, nothing's going to kick, nothing's going to leap because you continue to walk around the mountain and play with the thing. He's saying here, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Huh? Understand who your daddy is and what he's given you and get on the road to be equipped and be uh, ready to pay the price so that you can be infused with power from on high so that you can do the next thing. In verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, that's our first thing is we want victory and we don't understand the first part of victory is being able to just stand against the enemy. We stand in the midst of him looking like he's winning in the midst of the weapon having been formed, because it says the weapon will, will form, but it won't prosper. God allows it to form. But we got to be able to stand against his wiles, his tactics, uh, his means, his methods of operating, his trickery, his imagery. Imagery when he's talking to your mind, telling you how it's going to end up and how you're going to lose and you're never going to be anything and your situation's never going to change and all of that. Uh, we're in the book of Ephesians in the 6th chapter in the 11th verse right now. The book of Ephesians, the 6th chapter in the 11th verse. Satan begins to tell you how, you know, it's never going to change. You can't get up. Even now, I'm teaching this word. I'm teaching about the kingdom of God. I'm not teaching about man's church or none of that. My assignment in the earth is to teach about the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Not about a church. Just about Jesus Christ. So, he says, um, he says, you know, be strong uh, so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Because once you decide that you're going to follow after Jesus Christ and be totally on his side, now you got to understand all of heaven. Is 
All of heaven is coming after you now. Like that, that little blink that just went out right there. The devil don't want this word going out on a Friday night and we're a week away from Halloween. He got all his little people flying through the air, little witches on brooms. People got candles saying little prayers. People got little sticky dials they playing with. But none of that matters because our God is God and he's in control. You understand? And we got to be equipped. What he's telling us in his book of Ephesians is that until we avail ourselves and surrender ourselves fully, we will never be equipped to be the spiritual soldiers that we were created to be and saved to be and have the power that he desires us to have to be able to operate at the level that we need to operate at. Huh? That's all it's about is becoming spiritually strong and to learn all the pieces of your armor, how to properly apply them and how to use them. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high place. Now, isn't it amazing and sad at the exact same time that God has told us through his holy word and through his prepared vessels what's going on in every generation, in every generation that you're not wrestling against a man or a woman, against a government, against a police force, against anybody like that, that you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, that you're wrestling against, uh, uh, you're wrestling against principalities, against powers, huh? against the rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual wickedness in high places, meaning that people who are unsaved, who are disconnected from God, and even those who are immature in the things of God, who are double-minded, open themselves up for the enemy to come in to be of use, to move on his behalf, to discourage us, to try and destroy us, but ultimately, as you're strong and growing in the Lord, all they should be doing is pushing you closer into your destiny and into your purpose as you learn how to use your weapons of warfare. That's what Paul is telling them right now is recognize who you're fighting. Don't get angry at people. Grow up in the Lord. Get spiritually strong so you can recognize the enemy and how he's coming at you. Remember, it says in 2 Corinthians 2 and 11, least Satan should get advantage of us or take advantage of us, and we're not ignorant of his devices. If you don't know what you're fighting against and you think everybody's out to get you, then you will stay in anger, you'll stay in offense, you'll always be reacting instead of resisting. Can I say that again? You will always be reacting instead of resisting, not knowing that anything that comes your way once you decide to give yourself fully to God is nothing more than a tool in the hand of the Holy Spirit to shape you and mold you into the being that he's trying to make you. He's giving you what you asked for. You said, Lord, bless me. You said, Lord, I want a closer relationship with you. You said, Lord, I want to know you deeper. So God says, request granted. So he begins to send things your way to make you pray, to make you get on your knees, to make you come closer, to bring you into the word to open up your understanding, to teach you to speak those things is not as though they were, to learn how to rebuke demons in the name of Jesus. All these things have to happen because there's no way you can grow into a spiritually mature son or daughter of God without warfare. It's not going to happen. You need warfare. If you're going to be a champion in any sport, you're not going to be a champion playing against last place teams and teams that don't make the playoffs or teams that don't make you ready for the playoffs. You become a champion by playing against championship caliber teams. And in order to be a champion, you got to beat the champion. Amen. You got to beat the champion. It's just that there is no easy way to this thing. It costs what it costs. And what it costs is all of you at all times. We got to quit trying to sneak in the easy way and just, and just desire a salvation, a salvation, that is easy. You understand? That is easy. It's not easy. It is not easy. It costs everything. Jesus Christ did die for you. Yes, he did. But now you got to die for him. You don't think you have to die. You like life the way it is. And again, I don't, I don't get into all that because I see what I see and I say what I say 
But at the end of the day, everybody's fighting their own race and doing their own thing. And time will reveal that which is a counterfeit. And time will reveal those who are children and weak. Because your habits will expose you. You understand? You can't say that you're a son or daughter of the Most High God and you're not growing in godly, divine character. The devil is a lie. Your character will match your commitment to Jesus Christ. And at some point, you'll do something. You'll post something. You'll say something. You'll be out and do something else that exposes you, not understanding that that was God allowing you to show you where you are not and to quit playing. You understand? Because we're all held accountable. And again, nobody can judge you. The word judges you and your lack of commitment reveals you in the name of Jesus. So in verse 13, he says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now, why would you think Paul would tell us to take the whole armor of God? I mean, the whole armor. And we know that to be so because people pick and choose which parts of the Bible they want to obey. They pick and choose which parts of the word is for them and other parts are not for them. The part about prosperity and being blessed and everybody loves that part. Everybody loves that part. But the part about judgment, being convicted, being punished, being holy, walking a straight and narrow, very few people want that part. They don't want that part because that part does not line up with their plan for their lives, but it lines up with the plan God has for their lives. But they will ignore God's plan or try to until he allows circumstances and situations to get so out of order and so bent out of shape that you have to come back into the fold and go back to the beginning and start all over again, not knowing if you had just surrendered yourself, that he sent the Holy Spirit to help equip you to run this race and to walk this walk and to be conformed into the vessel that he wants you to be conformed. Again, I told you before, your blessings are secure. They are certain. There's no doubt you can be a blessed people. But only if you go about it the way God has ordained will you actually receive those blessings and experience them that the world can see. See, because the whole world waited for the manifestations of the Son of God. It's easy to always be yelling out, oh, I'm blessed. I'm covered by the blood. I speak those things as not as though they were. But yet you, the world needs to see. They saw it with Abraham. They saw it with Isaac. They saw it with Jacob. Huh? They saw it with Joseph. They saw it with Jesus. The world needs to see. See, because then when they see, they're going to want to hear. They're going to want to know, how did your God do that? Who is your God? You see, so we got to make sure that we continue to press and that we remain in his righteousness so that his righteousness and, and all the blessings he has that are aimed at you continue to seek you as you keep going because he said the blessings are going to overtake you. They're going to come on you suddenly. It's going to happen quick. It's going to come on you suddenly. You'll go from one day being in lack to being in overflow plenteous like Solomon. You'll go in one day from uh, not uh, understanding something to having great wisdom and great knowledge and great understanding. You'll go from one day not having great influence to being in front of people that are influencers. That's just the way God does it. He does it suddenly as you're faithful over a few things and as you remain faithful wherever he's planted you, then he begins to increase you and grow you up. But you got to grow up to be a spiritual soldier fully equipped to wear your armor and to know how to yield it because you continue to chase after Jesus Christ, huh? You're no longer chasing the things of the world. He's first. You're hungering, understanding that I am a babe, but then you go, I'm not going to stay a babe. Understanding that uh, maybe I'm chasing after things I shouldn't be chasing after, but God will give you the power to be set free from some of those things so that you can join with him and continue to follow him. Remember in the Bible, it's so amazing. It talks about Jesus. It says that he will leave the 99 and go after the one. And a deep revelation of that is maybe God knows that it's that one who's going to be the one that will surrender their lives and follow after him with everything. But those 99 won't. Those 99 are like the 4,000 and 5,000. They just want the fish and the bread. They want to be seen. You know, they want to be exalted. They don't want to die. But Jesus knows that that one, I got to go get that one. Because that one may be the one that turned the 99 around. 
That's why he'll leave the 99 and go get the one. And we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to be the one? Huh? Oh, hallelujah. It's not that God won't let you be. He said, be it unto you according to your faith. Are you willing to be the one? And if you're willing to be the one, then that means you're going to begin to read this book from cover to cover. You're going to begin to stay in this book. You're going to begin to memorize scriptures. You're going to begin to pray in your and your heavenly language as well as your natural language. And you're going to open yourself up for God to come in and rest in you and move you out and do what needs to be done. You're going to have a radical transformation. There's no other way to do it. And it happens in secret. huh? As you allow him to have his way in secret, when it's time for you to be publicly exposed or exalted or put out there, then you'll be prepared and you'll have a message and your life will be a message and it won't be a game just out here. Just anybody can say scriptures that's in the Bible. It takes nothing for anybody on Facebook. I see it all day long. They go in the Bible, they read, they get a scripture word for word and they put it on Facebook and they think that's supposed to deliver somebody and then they get likes and thumbs up. But that's fine. That's good. But there's more. There's deeper. And that's all God is saying. Even the devil fears God and he knows the scripture. He's saying, give me what I asked for so that I can make you a spiritual being to deal with the enemy, to help other people feel uncomfortable so that they can come all the way into the fold. So he says in 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Loins girt about with truth. We know the word of God is true. Huh? We have to have our minds wrapped up with truth, our hearts wrapped up with truth, which is only the word of God. It all comes down to the word of God. How much of it do you know? How much time do you spend in it? How much do you hunger to know it? Do you delight yourself in it? Everything that your heart is seeking and you desire is tied up in the word of God. Everything that the enemy has stolen from you is tied up in the word of God. Everything that's crooked in your life is tied up in the word of God because God says, I'm going to come in and fix it. He said, no good thing will I withhold from those who walk upright in me. When we get just a made up mind that this is it, I don't totally, I don't totally understand it, but I know this is it. So I'm going to get in the word knowing that he says that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. So it's God's job to give you understanding. It's not your job to understand. It's God's job to give you understanding. Because remember, he said wisdom is a spirit like everything else. It's a spirit. The spirit of wisdom will come upon you and then you will have understanding and you will grow in the grace and knowledge of everything that God has done and is desiring to do in your life. And through you, you understand? Because there is a territory set aside that you must take. There are people that are waiting to be delivered from your testimony and your deliverance, you understand? In your family and outside of your family. But it's never going to happen if you don't volunteer to give yourself up in the fullness of the measure that's required to be a soldier whose armor is properly applied, who can go into the war and the enemy begins to retreat because he knows you know who you are, whose you are, and how to use every weapon that you have. I mean, we always talk about David and Goliath almost every night. You can always go back to David. But isn't it amazing that when David wanted to go out and fight Goliath, that Saul offered him his uh, armor, that he offered him his shield, his breastplate, and helmet and everything else. And we know Saul was a very big man. The Bible says he was a big man. But David was a ruddy little guy. He was short. And all of his armor was too big. I mean, he couldn't do anything with it, even if he wanted to. It, it probably more than anything else would have uh, gave the illusion of protecting him. But in reality, it would have been a hindrance to him and a detriment to lead to his destruction simply because maybe he would have fallen. Maybe the helmet would have blocked his eyesight temporarily. Maybe he couldn't yield his shield because he couldn't even lift uh, Saul's shield. It was so heavy. And I'm saying to you the same thing is God is giving you weapons. He's giving you armor. But until you spend time with him, you don't really know what that armor is, how to defeat the giants in your life, the Goliaths in your life. You don't know how to properly defeat them right now because you have not spent enough time with him to grow up in the grace and knowledge of who he is. You're not stable enough to stand against the attacks that are coming against you knowing that you already win. You just simply need to stand and resist him 
until God finished teaching you and beginning, uh, begin, uh, 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 continues to reveal things to you that you need to know to become this soldier. You understand? It's a teaching session. You're in training. It's a class, but it's a class you got to show up for every day. It's a class you got to come to knowing that it's not about necessarily having your prayers answered right now. Your prayers are already answered. It's about you being equipped. We keep our minds stayed upon Christ Jesus because he says that if you keep your mind stayed upon him, he will keep you in perfect peace where you can forget about everything that's coming against you and understand that God said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all, that the attacks are supposed to come. They're supposed to come. They're for your glory. They're growing you up. They're teaching you. They're not to destroy you. So we get to the point where we begin to thank him in the midst of our adversity. We begin to thank him in our trials and tribulations because we know how it's going to end. No, it does not feel good. Yes, there are times when it will look totally different than what I'm saying. But when you're stabilizing him and you're planted as a tree planted by the rivers of water, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. The Bible tells us in uh, 1 Thessalonians, it says, in all things give thanks, huh? In all things and everything we give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you that we are so mature spiritually that we give him thanks for things that look like they're trying to destroy us for things that are going against us knowing that God is in control. That's why he says in the book of Matthew to not resist the evil. Don't resist the evil. He says, don't resist the evil. I'm going to say that again. Don't resist the evil. God controls the evil. The evil is not to destroy you. The evil is to develop you. The evil is to help you get patience. The evil is to push you closer in your relationship with him. The evil is to bring you further under subjection so that you don't speak against it, so that you don't react against it. All you do is say, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus. Help me, Lord, right now. And God begins to teach you to surrender. So now it's less of you and more of him, you see? And it's a process. It's a path that we're on. And we're in a world where people are going to always try your patience, push your buttons, say things to get you out of your character, try and get you to embarrass your God by saying and doing and posting things you shouldn't be because then they see that there's a lukewarmness and then the devil comes in and continue to go, that's not it. You see, we have to do things that are always edifying to God and that allows us to be the vessels that are, are prepared for the equipping of the saints. We equip the saints for warfare. Right now on today, what we're saying is you should, I'm hopefully something is being said to bless you to equip yourself further to become an even greater son or daughter of God to get deeper in the word so that you can be even greatly used by him for the spiritual warfare. He says in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, huh? The preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel prepares you, huh? It's a preparation mechanism. The preparation of the gospel of peace. It's called a lot of things. The gospel of good news, huh? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul calls it the gospel of peace. Did not Jesus say, my peace I leave with you? My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives unto you, huh? Peace, the gospel of peace. In a time of unrest, in a time of uncertainty, in a time when people's hearts are giving out because they're fainting, in a time where people are reaching and grabbing for anything that makes them feel good temporarily or temporarily helps them forget about their circumstances or their situations, God is saying, grab my gospel. It's the gospel of peace. It won't change. It won't forsake you. It will be with you through the times I'm training you until I equip you to go into your promised land. That's what the gospel will do for you. It will be your shield. It will be your comforter. It will be your provider. It will walk with you. It will talk with you. It will give you sweet sleep at night when everybody else are resting and turning and they can't sleep. God is saying, just allow me to show you who I am and that it's real. And in due season, I'm going to put you on display. And so many people are going to see my glory upon you that they're going to desire what you have. And because you said yes, 
and because you waited and you allowed me to develop you, you're going to be equipped to teach him. You see, we can get someplace too fast because we think we're ready and the devil will trick us that we're ready, but yet our character is not there and then we get there and we slip and fall and then we start going, well, ain't nobody perfect. Well, I'm just a babe still growing up. That's because you weren't stable and you got too fast, huh? You, you, got, you got hungry to get someplace instead of being patient and waiting, knowing that when God is ready, he's going to make it very clear that it's your time and it's your turn. You're going to know because you spent so much time with him that you would dare want to get ahead of him understanding the catastrophe you could create and the number of people that you could injure just because you got there too soon. Just imagine if Joseph, when he was in the prison, after he had gave the prophecies to the baker and the uh, and, and, and the king's uh, cup uh, bearer, that when he sent him back and he told him, don't forget about him, if that baker had told uh, the king about Joseph two years earlier before he got out, See, Joseph was not yet ready. Joseph could, Joseph had to stay two more years simply because Joseph was ready to interpret individual dreams, okay? He did, he did the interpretation of the two men in the prison. He probably did some more that we don't know about. We know when he was a boy, he shared his dreams with his brothers, his mother, and his father. He was equipped to do individual interpretation, but he needed two more years of isolation, two more years of suffering. Two more years of being in fellowship with nobody but God to be able to give the interpretation for a nation. Oh, hallelujah. To give the interpretation for a nation. So he was ready to interpret for individuals, but he weren't ready to interpret for a nation. And that's what I'm telling you right now. Every moment needs to be maximized and not wasted because you know not what God is preparing you for. It is a holy calling. It is a great calling. It's a calling for a nation. So we got to make sure that we don't let anything distract us or keep us from our fellowship with God, with our time with God. Not a television program, not a club, not a man or woman who's not your wife. Oh, hallelujah. We got to pay the price because all those things will be added to you and given to you once you get in position with him. God wants you to have all those things more than you want them, especially when you're his son or daughter. That's why he asked the man at the pool, always ask yourself this every day. He said, wilt thou be made whole? What an incredible question to ask somebody. Huh? We sit around and go, well, I got two ears. I got two eyes. My nose intact, my lips, my hands, my fingers, my knees. He's speaking deeper than external, huh? He's not talking about the external. He's talking about the internal. And on the internal, when he says, wilt thou be made whole, he's talking about being whole. If you want to be whole, you got to be willing to go through the process of being made whole. And that process by, it, 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 we're not equipped to understand it. We're never going to know it. Because it's not taught in schools. It's not taught in universities. Uh, people don't sit around the table and talk about it. Huh? Because being equipped to be made whole is something that only you can get in the fellowship with your God. That only you can get as your flesh is being chastened. As only you can get as you're being denied those things that give the flesh pleasure and a means of expressing and exalting itself then God has to bring you down a notch. God has to rope you like a calf. God has to handcuff you and put you in the prison like Joseph to equip you to become the answer to a nation, to teach you how to properly put on all your armor and boldly stand before Goliath and say, who is this uncircumcised giant coming before my God and equip you to deal with him? Isn't that a great blessing? Aren't you tired of the world being out of order when your God says you're the vessel that can bring it in order? Huh? You're the vessel that can bring it in order. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 8 real quick. Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8, family. It's Friday night. I bless you and I'm, I'm happy that you're here. 
You got to always know, even if you don't show up, I'm going to be here until God tells me not to be here. Because again, I understand my call is not for the 99. Oh, no, it's not. It's not for the 99. My call is for the one. I'm here for the one. Everywhere God sends me throughout the world, it's for the one. There's always one who has been ostracized, set aside, hungry, knowing that there's something more in them. All, they're at the end and God is saying, share the word. But all that's happening right now over Facebook is there's a new sound going out. There's a new way being revealed, which is not new at all. It's old as the earth, but it's not been preached because people want to keep you in the in their flock. It's like being in a stall with a thousand cattle. Everybody's just in there doing the same thing, looking alike. But God is saying, go in and open up the gate. Tell them to run out, to sprint out, because I have something for them. Tell them, don't worry about thinking about where they need to go. All they need to do is know that I'm looking for them. And as they begin to look for me and join themselves to me, then I will come upon them and I will put my mark on them and I will begin to lead, equip, and guide them and empower them for the purpose that they have been longing for their entire existence on earth. Because now is the appointed time for your fullness of salvation where you begin to work for him and tear down the kingdom of darkness and begin to set the captives free and heal the brokenhearted and open the blind eyes and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord to a nation that is hurting and hurting bad. Even though they don't look like it, they're hurting bad because there's no, there's no purpose. Every day you look up another black male or black female has been viciously murdered or slaughtered. Every, every day you look up another child has been kidnapped. Every day you look up another couple has divorced. Every time you look up there's some other calamity going on. And as a son and daughter of God who knows that we've been given all power, not some power, all power, but yet we sit back and we look and we're powerless to do anything because we won't give ourselves fully to our God to equip us to be able to handle some of these things. Are we going to be equipped to deal with all of it? Absolutely not. That's not our purpose, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying there are certain things, as a believer, once you turn yourself over in your area, in areas he's going to send you, you're going to be equipped to deal with a lot of those things. Sickness, he's saying, who's going to get to the point where you trust me enough where someone, they're blind, they've been blind their whole life, but I'm going to tell you to go lay your hands on them, and when you lay your hands on them, their eyes are going to open, and you're going to do it in obedience without doubting or, or, or shine up or worrying about the people that are around you. You're going to do it because God told you to do it because you spent so much time with him, and you come out of the world, and you know his voice, and you know you're in his righteousness, and you know how to wear your armor, that you're going to do it in faith, and as a result, that person is going to see again and the kingdom of God is going to be made manifest in a time where it's not happening, in churches where it's not happening. God is saying, I choose you to do it. You're going to get to the point where someone is going to be in stage four cancer and they're taking chemo and the doctors have sent them home to die. And God is going to say to those of you who will avail yourself, who've given yourself over for your natural man to die and your spiritual man to raise up, he's going to speak to you. Just like he told Philip to go down and meet the Ethiopian eunuch to open up the word of God, he's going to say, that one has been written off. I want you to go lay hands on them. And all I want you to do is speak what I say and I'm going to heal them on the spot and resurrect them and they're going to go back to their doctors and they're going to be confounded. All their loved ones are going to be confounded. Everybody else who came to see them in the hospitals are going to be confounded. Why? Because you died so that others can live, so that the kingdom of God can be spread. See, this is what this is about. This is not about you getting your new car and your new house. He's going to give you all that too. Don't even worry about that. That's carnal stuff. That's about you. We're saying we're going to give ourselves up so that we can be the answer to other people's deliverance. 
so that we can be the vessels that God can trust with his holy power that he's been waiting to give to generations of people who settle for just being a CEO, for just being a professional athlete, for just getting 100,000, 250,000, and then go, well, when it's over, I've done a good job down here. I taught kids, I served them, so now I'm gonna get my spot in heaven. Not knowing in Luke 2 and 2, that's not what he says. He said, many are gonna say to me in their day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name? Have I not cast out demons? Have I not done many wonderful works? And God says, he said, Jesus says, I'm going to profess to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, because you never paid what I desired for you to pay, which was you. I didn't need you to do all those things. Don't you know that I'm all powerful? I can speak to anybody if I want to and make them surrender. But that's not the system I have in place. The system I have in place is partial free will. It's not even total free will. It's partial free will. You understand? In the book of Psalms in the eighth chapter, is everybody there? I think I'm finally there now after doing all that. Look what he says in Psalms 4 through um, 6. Psalms 4 through 6. He's talking about you and I right now. He's talking about you and I, the psalmist, written by David. This is God talking to David. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor, the Bible says. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of the hands, of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, see, when I read that, me personally, I'm not talking about you. When I read that and I see that God has created me to have uh, stuck on the screen, but I got what you gave God up to God. Give that thing. OK, I think I'm having some problems on the screen. It's just one of them nights right now. So kind of hanging there with me on this Friday night. There's some reception issues going on, but uh, we're going to fight through this thing until until. Uh, the broadcast is over. Yeah, until the broadcast is over, we're going to fight through this thing. So anybody that can here or having some screen issues, just kind of bear with me. Uh, I have the hotspot and everything right here, so I'm trying to make sure everything goes through as smoothly as possible. But you got to know that this word that's coming forth right now, it's not going to come through smoothly. There's going to always be opposition. Because we're trying to pull you out of the very things that Satan has you comfortable in and has had you trapped in for a long time. He's not going to want this word to freely come forth to the willing vessel. You understand? To those who are being fed, to those whose curiosity is being pricked, to those whose ears are being circumcised. As you keep coming every night, he, he doesn't like that. You understand? If we were just talking about uh, just giving you some word and not challenging you and telling you how much you're going to be blessed and you can keep living the way you're living and you ain't got to die and come out of the world and all that. These things would be smooth and there'd be 5,000 people following this. But see, this is not about you receiving life the way he says it. It's about you losing life to receive life in the manner that Jesus Christ has ordained it. You understand? That's the life that he says the blessing of the Lord will make you rich and have no sorrow. So again, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. This takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden where God gave us dominion to replenish the earth and subdue, to take authority. So even right now, we have authority over the works of God's hands. We're, we're created to be in control. But yet we're not in control. And that doesn't bother a lot of people. The fact that they're not in control. They say they're blessed. But how can you be blessed when you're living on one fourth of your ability? Do you get that? One fourth of your creativity. One fourth of your spiritual capacity is being tapped. When God has given us authority over all the works of his hand. Everything he's ever created. Through Jesus Christ, who died and redeemed us, and when we're in him, we now have power and authority to speak things and do things as we sup with him.
that will increase his kingdom and glorify his name. How can anything be better than that? I don't think anything can. Please tell me. In the book of Job, let's go to Job, the 22nd chapter. Job 22, verse 28. Job 22, 28. Let's look at this real quick. Job 22, verse 28 says, He says, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. This is that power and authority that we just read about in the book of Psalms in the 8th chapter. You'll decree a thing. You'll speak a thing. And as you speak that thing, God says the light will shine upon your ways, and it will be established. What is he talking about? We're talking about what I talked about to you earlier. That when you get in him enough, you'll be able to be his vessel to do the impossible. That God will use you to do the incredible, the unthinkable, the thing that men are, are, are in fear about. You won't be in fear about because you know God is able. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8 real quick. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 real quick. Let's look at this verse. It's saying the same thing. We started out in Ephesians talking about the weapons of our warfare that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, huh? But against the principalities and the powers, huh? And the rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness in high places. So he already told us what we're fighting against. Now he wants to teach us how to get equipped to fight this fight, to receive our armor and to become bold soldiers so that he can use us to do it and that we aspire to do something greater than simply natural, carnal, worldly thing. Huh? Do you not remember in the Bible he said that only what you do for Christ is going to last? Only what you do for Christ is going to last. None of the trophies, none of the certificates, none of the banners, none of the accommodations of men, none of that is going to make it. None of it is even going to be considered because that's all just from man. God is saying, I have something greater for you than what men can give you. And I want to use you greater than you allowing yourself to be used. Look what Ecclesiastes 8 and 4 says. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? So God is saying, where your word is, when you get all the way in me, when I give you a word, who can say to you, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That doesn't make any sense. That's not going to happen. God is saying, I'm in control. What are you talking about? Who can stop me from doing what I want to do and what I've commanded you to do? But will you be bold enough to do it? Huh? Will you be bold enough to do it? I don't want people to just take people bread on Thanksgiving. No, no. I want somebody to multiply some bread. Huh? I want somebody to be used for something supernatural. But if that's not your heart's desire, then that's not going to be your portion. If you're comfortable down here just existing and, and getting your salary or whatever you're doing and you don't want to go through the tough times to be formed to do something great, because everybody's not built for it. I understand that everybody's not built to endure suffering and deny themselves when they can rescue themselves. That is an equipping of the Holy Ghost only. But if that is something you're willing to give yourself to God in terms of studying and getting in him, God will equip you to look like a fool for him so that when the time comes, he'll make you the king or the queen he created you to be and open up the windows of heaven and bless you in a measure that everybody who saw you in your low days and your down days will see you in your days of exaltation, in your days of being raised to the high place. And you won't be proud. You won't be braggadocious. You'll simply bless them. Because this is the time now when he goes, I'm going to uh, set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And you got to invite your enemies to the table to sit down and eat and teach them what God has taught you. You got to impart in them what God has imparted in you. That's what it is. You become blessed to be a blessing. Huh? The student becomes the teacher. Huh? The patient becomes the doctor. That's what it is. That's what it is. And that's what we're all about. We thank God. 
Let me look at the time right now, 8.34. We got about five more minutes. I'm going to let you go on this Friday night so you can enjoy your Friday night. I always thank God for you coming. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 real quick before we get ready to get out of here. We got about three more scriptures and we'll get out of here. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. We talked about the armor. We talked about putting it on. We talked about who we, who we don't fight against. You know, we're not fighting against our boss. We're not fighting against our husband. We're not fighting against our brother, our sister, our mother. We're not fighting against our neighbor. They're only vessels of the enemy that he inhabits, that he freely moves through because they're temporarily blinded for a time. So you got to be able to be so into God that you can stand and resist all of that because imagine all he wants you to do is smack somebody, hit somebody in their head, get locked up, uh, get fired, and put yourself in a position that God does not want you in. He expects you to win. He invested in you to win. He's given you enough to resist all the attacks that come against you. And if you're not strong enough to resist some of these things, all you're saying is your eye is not single and you're not spending enough time with him. That's all it is. That's all it is. If Jesus Christ could equip all the ridicule of the people who, who, who came against him night in and day out, every time he was doing nothing but trying to offer them the free gift of salvation, he's saying that if they call me beds above, how much will they re, uh, reject the, those who follow me? They're going to reject you too. They're going to say things. But he's saying, I've given you a covering. I've equipped you to be able to let that bounce off you. Don't even worry about it because I'm in control and vengeance is mine. So look what he says in uh, chapter 10, 3, 4. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Huh? We don't fight after the flesh. We don't get caught up in that stuff and that foolishness because that's all it is. It's foolishness. It's to get you distracted of what's important. It's to steal all the seeds that we that God has planted in you the time we've been together and it wants you to remain as a child and carnal and struggle growing up and being able to love your neighbor as you love yourself, to be able to love your enemies, to be able to bless those that hate you, huh? That's what he's saying. I expect you to get to this point. I, be, I expect you to pray for those who uh, despitefully misuse you and persecute you. That's what this is about. He's saying that is real. That's not something that you just hear. That's something I expect. I expect you to get to that point. huh? You're the vessel that I've chosen to do that to. But if you don't get there, it's because you keep resisting me and you love where you are more than where I'm trying to take you. huh? And because you keep resisting the training that I have to take you through to get you there. It's not a training you understand. It's not a training you've ever endured before. It's supernatural. If you knew about it, then I can't be God, huh? It's a process that we go through step by step. And 90% of it is not going to feel good. 90% of it we're not going to understand. But the great thing about it is he says, I'm with you all the way. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Don't worry about it. People will. Because they don't understand it and they say it's ridiculous. But he said, don't worry about people. When I'm making you a king or a queen, I separate. And when I get you where you're going, all those who walked off, I got a new group of people who are going to come on who's going to help you do everything I created you to do and be in the way I needed you. So he says, for we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, huh? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God, huh? Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, my Lord. You know, that's what the Lord gave me for you on tonight. And it was just Ephesians chapter 6. If you get an opportunity again tonight, read over it again. Chapter 6, verse 12 on down to about 16. You can go back to 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5. You can go back to uh, 
Ecclesiastes 8 and 4, Psalms 8 and 4. You can go back to uh, and read them because they're very, very important in the journey that we're on. You know, we're trying to become something that uh, maybe nobody in our family has. Maybe nobody in our neighborhood has. Maybe nobody we went to high school or college with has. You're trying to do something in a generation where people won't turn themselves over. That they love being lukewarm. They love being falling down in sin from time to time. They love not becoming all that God said they can be. It's just a generation we live in. But I tell you something else. That doesn't have to be your portion. Let the 99 go ahead and do what they're going to do. You be the one. Don't worry about the 99. That's God's business. You be the one. Someone always has to be first to show everybody else the way. In every family, there's one who's the first one to graduate from high school. There's one who's the first one to go to college. There's one who's the first one to ever own a new car. There's always one first of something. And those are natural things, which are good. Okay, great. We, we, we pat you on the back. But God is saying, I'm giving you something that supersedes that natural thing. You be the one because of your life that I will save the rest of them. You be the one because of your life that I will do something that's never been done before. You be the one where I will write your name throughout the halls of the history of faith that when we're all reunited in heaven, we will talk about you and your conversation will line up when you stand with Daniel, with Paul, with Matthew, and they go, what'd you do? And Paul goes, well, I love the Lord so much that I was crucified upside down. And you'll stand there with John the Baptist and go, well, I love them so much that I rebuke Herod about Heronius and her being his wife and he had my head cut off. Or you can talk to Daniel and he'll go, I love the Lord so much that I prayed with the windows open and he threw me here and let me go in the lion's den, but he shut the lion's mouth. Or you'll hear the three Hebrew boys talking about, well, we loved them so much that we wouldn't bow down and worship the idols and they threw us in the fiery furnace. And then they get to you and you go, what'd you do? And you go, well, I don't know. And you're waiting for your turn before the judgment seat because you have not turned yourself over to be used and to do something great in the presence of the Lord, to change your generation, huh? to be one of those who are bold for him, to stand against the system, huh? to use your life to save many other lives. That's what this all is about. That's what it's for. That's what you were created for. That's what his glory looks like. So let's pray right now in the name of Jesus as we end our Friday night together that everybody will be blessed, that everybody will stay in their respective places and not move to the left nor to the right. Keep looking ahead. Hold on to the unchanging word of God. Get your expectation level up. Allow him to move whatever needs to be moved, to touch whatever needs to be touched, but expect him to do something great in your life because he said, be it unto you according to your faith. As you expect God to move, that's the measure he'll move in. There's a generation of young people waiting behind you that needs to see that there's something greater than anything they're seeing in the world, that they don't have to go on American Idol, that they don't have to go on Short Tank, that they don't have to do some of this other foolishness that strips you of your glory. You simply need to hold on to your God, turn yourself over, become the word, and watch him do something awesome in your life. Let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. Dear God, oh Heavenly Father, we thank you for the night. We thank you for the word that has gone forth. We ask that you guard hearts and minds, O oh Heavenly Father, that you watch over your word, knowing that you watch over your word and you'll perform it, Lord Jesus. We ask that uh, any, anything that's going on in the lives of those who are sitting under the broadcast right now or that will listen to it at another time, that you come in and you take control and you just uh, uh, you, you just do what only you can do, oh, Heavenly Father. Bring order where there's disorder, oh, Heavenly Father. Bring ease where there's dis-ease, oh, Heavenly Father. Bring peace where there's confusion and give us the ability to just stand right now knowing that your salvation and your deliverance is certain if we can just resist the devil. Resist the devil, O Heavenly Father. In due time, you will make sure that he is destroyed and banished from our lives because you have a purpose and a plan for our lives. And we know that your word will not return void. It's going to accomplish that which you set it out to do because you are he who sits high, look low, and you reign supreme in all the matters of the earth. It does not matter from the smallest thing to the greatest thing. It's your word, O oh Heavenly Father, that will eventually stand 
and in the end. We thank you again for this time of fellowship. We thank you again that it is so that we're a blessed people. And until we meet again, oh, Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise, all the glory in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless everybody on night. Everybody have a great night. And remember, stay planted, stay strong, stay connected. You come too far to turn back now. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Let the word of God be your guide as you discipline your flesh and you continue to stay in righteousness, knowing that when you stand in his righteousness and you stay connected to him, you're saying to God, I qualify for everything you have for me. I want my inheritance, Lord. I'm chasing after you, Lord. And then all the angels of heaven begin to look and God begins to stir up things in the atmosphere and you become a magnet for that which you could never get by the toil of your hands, by the limited intelligence of your mind, by your beauty, or by who you know. No, 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 none of that. The universe begins to bless you in a way that you could never be blessed. And your testimony is formed how great your God is when you surrender to him and you remain planted in the place he has planted you and endure everything you must endure. In Jesus' name, have a great night.